So welcome, Amy. I'm so excited to talk to you. Talk to me about what is a highly sensitive child? Yeah, I think it's a really important question, especially because we tend to immediately apply something to that. We define it ourselves. And that's not what it is at all. And it's not a disorder. It's not something that's going wrong with the child. Uh, highly sensitive kids are people who are synonymous with the word too, T-O-O. <laughs> they might be too much. They might be too inquisitive. They might be, and it might come with a little bit of intensity and that's part of the two. Um, they might be too quiet or too reserved or too- um, Sensitive. Yeah, and too sensitive, of course, or too emotional. Mm -hmm. And really what's going on there um, is they are children who are so primed with a, a different nervous system than other people have that they, if they get separated from their knowing, I'm going to say that big picture thing, they are in trouble. And so, I mean, I'll talk about probably how that unfolded for me, but Elaine Aaron, so it's just Elaine and then A-R-O-N is really the one who founded this work. And she was with a therapist. She is a psychologist. And the therapist said to her, you're just too sensitive. And it really stuck with her. So she started doing research on people and found 20% of the population falls into this category of highly sensitive. And it's really misunderstood when we can't have kids who are highly sensitive. Um, a society doesn't understand, well, let me say American society, say in Japan, they recognize these kids at about third grade and start cultivating what that is in them because they recognize what a boon it is in things like business. Mm -hmm. So we really miss the mark on how, who these people are and what the purpose of their, the way they are is for society. Yeah. And I mean, 20%, that's one in five. I mean, that is a staggering amount of the population for, I mean, here I am in 2021, a mom of four, and I've never heard of this. So you were going to talk about doing a discredit to one out of every five people, you know, in our world, in our community. Well, and I'll reinforce that with something else that's going to help you understand why this hasn't come out so well, is 70% of that 20% are um, introverted. So mm -hmm. they don't speak up. They sit and they observe and they figure things out and they stay quiet. And then 30% are um, extroverted. But I believe I have a friend who is highly sensitive, as am I, and we are both able to stand on the stage in public speak and, and do these things and be very social. And then we want to go away and hide for a little while, you know, and just be by ourselves. So I think there's something in there about ambiverts because I certainly gain energy by also being with people. But sometimes I do need to be alone. It's a balancing act. Mm -hmm. But I think for many highly sensitive, they need so much time alone. And the reason is it's to process. They take in 50,000% more information and stimuli in their world than, than the other 80%. And that's what mm -hmm. makes it kind of tricky. And it's a good reason that they have that ability. But as a human in this very stimulating environment, I said to my, my daughter, we live near a highway that's very busy and there are billboards everywhere. And I said to her, if one thing could come out of COVID, what would be really great is if all those billboards got to taken down off the highway. <laughs> Just something beautiful like art put up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so. so talk to me, you said you're highly sensitive. Talk to me about your journey in discovering, because it's, it's not a diagnosis. So is it a categorization? I can get that word out. Um, personality type. Okay. So a lot of your people who are highly sensitive adults are going to range in an INFJ personality type, which is the most rare, or it's like an ENFP, I think is the other one that's very common in the highly sensitive, but there probably are people who are anomalies, right? They, they learn ways to survive, or I mean, a whole bunch of reasons. And for me, I did not know this until probably a decade ago, I read Elaine Aaron's book and then I thought, boy, that sounds a lot like me, but I really didn't think too much of it until about two years ago. She has a movie called Sensitive that I believe you can get on Amazon Prime. Mm -hmm. And I watched that and I, for about two days, I felt this awareness of it must have been really hard for people like my teachers and my parents and my family and people to understand me. Um, because of how I was built. And I could see that, you know, like I cried a lot as a child, but I cried to the, 
you know, breathing in like that type of crying because mm-hmm. I couldn't mm-hmm. settle down because I was processing too much, but I didn't know that. Mm-hmm. And so the stimulation of something like trauma is way more, it leaves a much deeper indelible mark on people that are highly sensitive, which isn't, you know, oh no, poor you. It's more, that's a reality. So for me, then a few days later, I, I hit a depression. And the reason I did is I realized they didn't try very hard for me. They didn't try mm-hmm. and say, what's going on there? They just looked at me as, as weak and unable. So to turn that into the other side of looking at the power of it, my friend and I were traveling to listen to Elaine, Elaine Aaron speak in New York in 2020. And when um, we were at a bar or this wine bar, and this man came over to us and he said, well, where are you from? And what are you doing in New York? And we told him, and he, when we said, we're here to, talk, to hear this um, speaker about high sensitivity and people are, are being highly sensitive. What he did is he leaned in to try and take advantage of us or to try and make us feel low or weak. And I said to him, <laughs> because I'm fierce, I kind of put my hand up and I was like, well, the reality is we probably know more about you than you know about yourself. And that's what high sensitivity has to do with. So what you're thinking it has to do with probably isn't right on. And he backed up because he realized, oh, wow. So high sensitivity, people are empathic. They tend to be more intuitive. And what I mean by that is intuition is really the basis of it is about um, the patterns that we see. And so high, highly sensitive people are going to see more patterns because they're taking way more information. The high sense or highly sensitive person too also tends to make change. And they do that because they can't walk across the street when the jackhammer is happening right there. They cross the street and go on the other side. But they also are somebody who says, there is definitely a way to make that quieter. And then mm-hmm. they go and create it. They're, they're adept at problem solving, or I should say we're adept at it. And that's where it's not a disorder. It's actually Elaine Aaron believes through her research. It's an, an evolutionary reason these people exist. And it's like this. If we start seeing things are happening out in our world, we'll make them change. And Mm -hmm. we're people who can have high expectations in a way of altruism and perfectionism because we're the people who, if the water's coming, we can sense it and we get everybody to high ground to a fault where we will let our lives be let go in order to get people to high ground because it's how we feel inside. Mm -hmm. So it's a strange experience to feel so much understanding and ownership for other people it could definitely look like codependency in an adult easily Mm -hmm. there's an understanding of um of being a protector by nature so Mm -hmm. in a family there can be a kid who's a bully and this other kid who's highly sensitive and what happens for them is they take on the emotions Mm -hmm. and they'll carry them because they can do that they can carry a, a heavy weight and and they won't really be aware of that or they um, definitely there's there's power in a highly sensitive and that's part of the deal. But, but a highly sensitive child, <clears throat> if separated from their knowing, which tends to really show up around kindergarten to first grade. And if that's the case, they're really bucking the system of how school works. Those children would be better off if the teacher said, what interests you? Mm, horses. Okay, go to the library and find books on horses. Those kids will teach themselves to read because remember they're adept at assimilating Mm-hmm. And strategically changing things. So they're not going to let not being able to read hold them back. They'll just figure it out. And that sounds funny, but my son did it. We didn't know he could read. And at four and a half, he said, can I read the book after lunch? And I said, sure. <laughs> and he read a word. One of the words in the book was interrupted and he read it with fluidly. So, wow. so I didn't, but there it is, right? We never said like, this is an A, this is, or, you know. Um, so these kids assimilate fast and then if you see a child at really eight, nine, or 10, what they're bucking if they start to break down, a lot of those kids become angry and they, they to a doctor, they look like they're depressed mm-hmm. and that they have anger issues and they, you know, but what's really happening as I see it is they're bucking the system because they can already start to see that middle school hormonal junk coming. And what, how they're seeing that ahead of the other kids is they're seeing I used to, I'm a girl and I used to play football with all the boys and now they don't want me to play with them. Mm -hmm. And I'm a girl and I, (laughs) you, so they see these structure breaking or changing and they don't like that. Mm -hmm. Another piece that's a bit synonymous with a highly sensitive is this 
sense of equality, there's no hierarchy in them. So when I've taught classes to young students, I say, please call me Amy, not Mrs. Vasterlin. And, and that's important, like that feels right to me because mm-hmm. it's my nature as a highly sensitive person. There's no hierarchy, You're, we're equals, let's get in this together, let's collaborate. So there's that nature too within the tends to run in these people, but they can really get off, um, off track based on the parental or school message of you have to do it my way. And while that seems hard, I in no way mean these children can run amok and go crazy. Absolutely not. There are boundaries and there are understandings, but I'm gonna tell you a quick example of my daughter. She came home and I did not know she was highly sensitive. I didn't really get all this at that point. She came home from kindergarten, half day kindergarten, two and a half hours, right? Not much. (laughs) And she stood in her entrance hall and she (laughs) said, mom, I'm overwhelmed. And you know what I thought I wanted to say to her is like, are you crazy? <laughs> you, let's talk about me. Right? I wanted to head right into the controlling narcissist. Yeah. You know, but, you know, um, how, how can you not deal with this is what I wanted to judge her. And instead I paused for a second and I said, um, what do you think you can do about it? Cause I didn't know what the heck to do. I was, but I didn't go after her. Like, what are you going to do about that? I just said, what, what do you think you can do about that? And when she paused in that moment to feel that, that's what was important is she, she sensed that information that I was sharing with her and she settled into overwhelm. And so this is a big deal in our world right now because you see a lot of men are angry and, and, mm-hmm. all this, and, and a lot of it is they never got to express these emotions. So mm-hmm. what I did is I let my daughter drop into the overwhelm. Then she had, I'm from Minnesota, so she had Charlie Brown eyes, you know, <laughs> Charles Schultz is from here, the <laughs> Charlie, or Scooby, or not Scooby, you know what, Snoopy. So she had this look on the outside of her eyes of um, just withered. And I thought, holy cow, what is going on? And so I said to her, this is bringing her back to her knowing. I did not, again, know what I was doing, but I said, well, some kids, might sit and play with toys in the living room by themselves. Some kids might color at the table while we're making lunch. Some kids might, and this is her thing, go up to their room and read books with their door opened or closed. Oh, and then what I said to her, I doubled up without realizing it either. And I said, well, your your brother and I are going to make lunch and you stay up there as long as you need. Okay, that's another thing that the highly sensitive need is they need the space to process as long as they need on their terms, which Mm -hmm. might seem selfish, but it is a need. It's not, they're not being mean. And so as a result, I said to her, we'll have your lunch out, but if we finish, we'll wrap it and put it in the fridge and you can get it whenever you can eat, whenever you want. Like if she didn't eat lunch, I didn't care. That's fine. You know, she's mm-hmm. just living her life. And she came down in 10 minutes and, and was back to being who she is, full of life, happy. And that's the misstep that a lot of parents make. I was lucky that I, I was tuned in and just paused and said, what do I do with this? And it hit me funny, I think, is why I paused and reflected back to her, how do you solve your own solution or your own position? So for kids, yes, they need natural consequence and they need to solve their own problems. But for the highly sensitive, it's pretty essential because they do know how to solve their own problems at a high level. And if you keep getting in the way, they're gonna become angry, frustrated, depressed, um, anxious, because they're going to think, I don't know how to do any of this because my, my internal knowing is so convoluted now. I don't even know where to begin. Mm-hmm. And I recognize that generally, generationally, we've kind of just started recognizing feelings in people, you know, that we're just started giving people space, that it's more commonplace, you know, the way my parents grew up. I mean, girls, boys, but nobody talked about, you know, emotions or feelings and, you know, it was a bucket up and there was, you know, the disconnect and you don't cry and, and all of these things and, and creating space for, for all children, for all people to have their experience, to have their feelings is a really beautiful thing. You know, I loved that you said you kind of paused and had, and you, you saw this kind of turning in. And I think kids highly sensitive or not, don't even know how to process whatever they're feeling. They're either told they're, they can't experience it or they're wrong or it's too much or not enough or, you know, whatever, you know, they're getting back in return. And so checking in and being able to kind of tap into that, that was a really beautiful intuition for you and insight. That's not nor- like the commonplace. No, you're right. <laughs> you're right. 
But the other piece of it is, and this is true, is what's good for the highly sensitive child is good for every child. But what's good for mm -hmm. every child is not good for the highly sensitive child. So an example of that would be if, if we get angry at our child and it takes our child from zero to 60 fast, right? They're scared. A non-highly sensitive child can be brought back down to 40 pretty quickly by control or by enabling. Oh, I'll give you this treat if you do this, or um, you're going to do it. They'll, they'll chip. But a highly sensitive can only come down to about 59 with that. Well, that's not very far down because mm -hmm. they're processing at such a much higher rate. And so it's frustrating to them because they can't process any faster. They are processing a lot more information. So the pause is an essential piece and letting them experience their feeling and inform a decision from their knowing. My kids, my daughter went camping with a friend way out in the boondocks and she is not, she's a city kid and her friend is too. So I said to the mom, the other mom, if my daughter and my daughter stepped away to use the bathroom when we were having lunch before they left. And I said, if my daughter says we are not going to backpack into this place, we're not doing it. I said, you follow her because she is so in tune with how that sensing is that she won't fail you. Something you'll read in the paper, something happened there. Somebody got hurt by an animal, somebody, whatever. So listen to her. And the mom, the other mom was really excited because they keep a tracker on the children to know where they are all, at all times. And these are 20 year olds. So I'm not into that. I'm not into tracking mm -hmm. my kids, but I am into them. If they sense it's wrong or something's up, to stop because they are highly sensitive. It's their greatest ability is to mm -hmm. know and sense that. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is a story. And luckily this woman I know said I can freely share it, but her son was a, a really a mess when he was in seventh, eighth, ninth, 10th grade. He could not sync up with the school system. So she pulled him out and it, luckily they had the advantage of hiring a private tutor for homeschooling for two years. And then the mom took him on for the, the third year in, in ninth grade. And he went back to school in 10th grade and it was hit, it was up and down. And he, he graduated with, I swear to God, she said a 1.7 GPA. And the reason was he's yeah. brilliant. Mm -hmm. Like he couldn't, he, this is odd, but he couldn't make art. He couldn't do those things. So he would say to the art teacher, I'm not gonna draw that thing, but I will read this 500 page book about this artist and, and give you a 10 page paper on it, right? But she, the teacher didn't let it. So then he'd get a bad grade. So these are the ways, and this is synonymous with the highly sensitive. Here's the deal is they know the pathway of least resistance. I have a child who, when she's been tested, she is literally brilliant in one area in her life in writing. And mm -hmm. so when it came time to get into high school, she would do the AP US history class and rock it and go out. Like her friends had to take them 15 hours to do this assignment that they had to do eight times during the term. For her, it would take her six because she was so adept at reading and writing but she mm -hmm. would never do the worksheet. And I eventually let go because I realized she is changing the school system by saying, mm -mm. and, and her long-term grades are not bearing on that brilliance and ability. And she knows inside, that's not moving me where I'm headed. This other big project that's very hard, she's not trying to get out of that. So she is not lazy, but she's mm -hmm. focused. And I, I, it took me a long time. I had to deal with myself as a parent a lot because it's common to say, you're going to have to deal with things you don't like. But what I realized yeah. is that, that sets you up to work for a boss who creates anxiety in you. Mm -hmm. because you're jumping through their hoops instead of listening and saying, here's a better way to do it. And if you're in an environment who won't listen to you saying, here's a better way to do it. Let's have a conversation. Let's get into collaboration about this. Is that a place you want to work? So right. with my kids, I also took this position of, is that creating anxiety in you? And, and what do you want to do about that? What's it informing you about? But not to a way of like, Let's look at that more. When you know, you let me know. It's on the mm -hmm. um, state responsibility. So needless to say, this kid that is, this woman I know, he went through high school. Somehow he got into college. Somehow he got his master's degree. And he got out to the world and he started working for the CIA. He married a woman from Egypt. He lived in London. And because of this ability, this high intuition, this high pattern, pat, like a, a ability to see patterns at a, a rare extent, <laughs> He saw that, I'm not going to say which one because it would out him too much, but there was going to be a conflict in the world and he saw it ahead of time and called it out to the U.S. government. They did not listen. And then mm -hmm. they recognized he had seen that and knew exactly, exactly what would happen. And that's exactly what happened. So they gave him some sort of an award 
and said, we will now listen to you, please let us know and, and moved him into a position where he can even be more effective with looking at the pattern. Mm -hmm. So if you feel like your kid is going to be a failure, but you can see in them, they have this high ability in some area, just forget it. Just be okay with and deal with yourself as a parent, because it is very challenging. And I had to go through it. And with my husband too, you know, to not be on top of the homework and you're smart enough and you're capable of A's and B's what's happening. Um, not worth it with the long term. I mean, how many people remember what they got on their SAT or ACT? Not many. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so did that have a lot of bearing on your life? It did when you were 17. But right. You, not at 40. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Who cares? Yeah. Um, so we need to think more that way because what's happening in my idea or in my mind is we have a lot of really able, capable people in a whole a range of shapes and forms in our world. And they're not actually getting to express that forward. And to me, the world is in a state we don't want it in. And so if we had allowed all of this expression of people, would we not be in that position? Because there were so many people, uh, but we accepted, you're not in the form I think is the form, you know, maybe you're too fat, maybe you're not as smart as I think you should be or whatever it is, but they might be the one who has the ideas. And we minimize that by isolating and saying, well, high sensitivity is a disorder. No, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, um, is, and I'm not speaking from a place of background and knowledge, except for I have a little background um, with clients with bipolar disorder, just a small amount. And what I have seen with that is it's an ability. And I don't fully understand that, but why haven't we ever looked at these disorders as an ability and really researched or really challenged that? Instead, we're quick to, minimize people. And mm -hmm. I don't like that. <laughs> I just don't like that. Yeah. Well, no, we want them to fit into a nice tiny little box that we create. That's very confining. And if they don't, then, you know, we label them with a disorder or, you know, a diagnosis. I, I want to get back to kids, but I want to ask you a question. Do you just experience this kind of recent discovery of yourself in the last few years, as you've gone down this path that you were highly sensitive? Did you have to go ahead? I'm sorry. Well, yes. But what, what happened is I must have had some um, deeper understanding of it, Jessica, when my children were little, but I didn't know that. So yes, right. the terms and the way to define it, I just always felt different, which is synonymous mm -hmm. with being highly sensitive. Sure. Sure. And my question is without being fostered growing up, uh, did you have to dust off the sense of intuition? Did it get kind of dull? You know, like I think of something like flexibility. If you don't use it, you know, or kind of you lose it. And so trusting your intuition, trusting your gut when you're told, I imagine so much growing up without being recognized for this ability that you're wrong or that's not right. You know, that you, you start to lose faith in your own intuition. did you have that experience? I would say yes, but I also am an entrepreneur who mm -hmm. helps people um, use, like, I use my intuition to help them counsel and understand themselves better. So mm -hmm. I did not lose it. If anything, it got stronger. I grew up in a, um, I, when I say high level, I mean, my people are smart and they are super quick. So I grew up in a kind of high stakes, emotional and mental abusive home. And as a result, what I took from that is I could have had, I, there's nowhere I could have gotten that education at a school or university like I did from these people. So it was a great gift because it really taught me something. But coming out of that environment, I believe what really happened is based on the traumatizing environment, I got really adept at using my intuition because I had to feel and sense what was going on because the words coming out of their mouth weren't really what was happening right? Oh, wow. Yeah. I, and that's where, I mean, you know, I had a therapist once that said, you are like 29 steps ahead of what I just mentioned. And that's that as a result of that. And that's also a little bit common with the highly sensitive. Well, it's a defense mechanism too, right? I mean, you're to be ahead is to help keep you safe and protected. That's right. That's right. Mm -hmm. And even though there, the, on top of that, there would be a contortion that still dismantled my power. I believe that's the result because I'm very powerful and I, I was as a child, it was very wise, you know, and, and so on. So, so I feel like I get that. I can understand it wasn't 
they weren't trying to deserve me, but they were hurting so badly inside. And that had nothing to do with me, but it took me years to figure out I'm okay. And I'm also an mm -hmm. entrepreneur, which there's so much self-doubt. We hit different <laughs> levels of fear because we're like, okay, now I'm going to be a public speaker because that's what's calling inside of me. And that's a whole new arena of self-doubt. And then we hit this new level of, I'm going to write a book or, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're in it, Jesse. But, but I think that, you know, entrepreneurs and um, there's one other group I think of too, who, you know, are high creatives, artists, right. big for self-doubt, right? I can't go and sing on stage. Um, yeah. So I think that's just the nature of the job I have. So I can't say if that's as a result of being highly sensitive. But the one thing mm -hmm. I will say is there's a book for adults called how to make work work for the highly sensitive. And I'm so sorry. The first name or the first name of the person is Barry, but I cannot remember their last name or anything, but that's a way to search it, you know, of course on Google um, or wherever you search things. And that book was life-changing for me because it said mm, a highly sensitive is probably going to want to change job or jobs every four years. That's exactly what I used to do. Right. So, and, and it explains why. And that we might play low instead of playing to our highest extent and why. And it, it helped me realize more about myself than actually Elaine Aaron's book. Uh, so that was. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for that resource. Uh, let's get back to kids. When I see so my youngest, let's not talk about mine. Let's talk about kids in general. There's so many, I think, new diagnoses of ADHD, kids getting diagnosed with um anxiety, depression, all of these things are probably tenfold than, you know, even a decade ago, you know, 20 years ago. Are highly sensitive children being misdiagnosed with some of these other, um, I don't want to call it differences, you know, brain differences? I mean, I think my daughter who was, who was in second grade was diagnosed in first grade with generalized anxiety disorder and ADHD. And it just threw me for a loop, you know, I don't see her, you know, kind of filling into that category. I just find if, you know, this is something that's not really known or commonplace that they could often get chucked into another bucket. 5,000%. Yes. Yeah. That's the problem. So here's what I'll tell you as an example to, to really give you an understanding. I went to a NAMI parent support group, which is the national Alliance for mental illness. And there were 10 families there. And I was the last person at the table and they didn't know me, but I listened to all their stories. And I said to them when it was my turn, I am not here to offend you. So if at any point I say something that is not okay with you, I want you to call me out. I'm not going to have any, I won't be upset about that, but I'm here to look for highly sensitive children. That's what I'm here. I'm here to listen to your stories. And I said, I identify that three of the children here are highly sensitive. And is it okay with you if I say who I believe it is? And the parents all agreed. And I said, your child, your child, and your child. And I said, I bet that your child could stand on a stage and public speak and then want to be in their bedroom for the rest of the week. And they said, um, how, you know, it's like, you know, our children, how did you know this? And so, yes. And I would say, I, I can't say from thousands of experiences, but from the handful that I have with highly mm -hmm. sensitive and mental illness, they tend to quickly have suicidal ideation at young ages. And one of the reasons mm -hmm. I believe that is, is they are here to protect everybody else and nobody is protecting them. And they're like, if you, if I can't protect you, doctor, and you, mom, and you, then I have no purpose here. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's this kind of an annihilation of who they are by actually getting them into that system. So things that are more appropriate, just as an opportunity, I'm not saying don't medicate and don't, is if you suspect that your child is highly sensitive, trying things like floral essence. <laughs> there are floral essence practitioners all over the country, you know, or all over the world. And it's a way, because it's more subtle for their, their, the way that they're built and to see if it takes the edge off of some of those emotions. And then I would get into high gear to focus on um, letting that child know for themselves, what do you feel about that? And now I'm not saying if they are suicidal, saying, what do you feel about going to the doctor? <laughs> no, they no, no. Yeah. And you need, if it's in a crisis situation, you need to do what you need to do to keep them safe until they can level out or whatever. But I, I do think um, these kids don't fall into the same thing, but they can get depressed and anxious easily because look around. If they feel mm -hmm. responsible for that, and I was that kid, I actually probably was quite a bit like your daughter, but mm -hmm. they didn't have those terms at that point. And my pediatrician, who was uh, pretty world-class actually, which is awesome, 
I remember him looking at me like, what is going on with you? He cared so much about me, but he couldn't figure me out. He thought they thought I wasn't getting enough protein and they thought I wasn't, you know, yeah. I was a skinny, scrawny kid. Um, but, but they couldn't figure out what was a mess. So yes, these kids and, and you'll, I mean, I think when they get into the system, they'll probably heighten to suicide faster than other kids. That's what I would mm -hmm. say, but that's about all I can say. Mm -hmm. And if your kid could be in front and center and then be totally out of the light, there's potential you have this highly sensitive one. Mm -hmm. So let's say we suspect that our child or anyone listening suspects that they have a child that may be highly sensitive. What's the first step in supporting them and, and educating ourselves and, you know, our teachers, our other educators, our friends and support system about our child so that we can best support them. Right. So the two, um, I found two parenting methods that work really nicely with these kids. And the reason is they align with the child's knowing and their consequence. So they learn based on their own actions and then have to you know, give back when they mess up. So love and logic, especially if you have teenagers um, that you get on that, it, it's a, it's a finesse and an art form to learn that way. But I feel like that is a really perfect way and model for these highly sensitive kids. If you have younger ones, and you can use this with older ones too, but the book, How to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk, it's by Elaine Faber and or Adele Faber and Elaine Mazelish out of um, New York. That book is old. <laughs> So the, the examples in it are kind of old, but one of the things I would say to a young child, and you can use this right out of this, you know, podcast is you have a young child who comes home and is like, mom, it's just unfair or has any issue that they're upset about. Hmm. Just have empathy, hmm. just so easy. And then when, then they'll talk more, it's like they can process through, well, and then this happened, blah, blah, blah. Oh. and that's from the, how to talk. So people listen. And then, oh, well, maybe I could do this. Hmm. You just enforce with some supporting words, but you don't get in there. And for the highly sensitive, that's pretty well magic because they're, they're trying to process so fast. And if you give them the space to listen and let them process through, mm -hmm. they can make the connection faster to the result. So in essence, that's your biggest strategy. Even with a teenager, I think you could use that if they didn't recognize what you're doing. Um, but, but love and logic to hold the boundaries, especially with teenagers, because they can get snarky. They're hormonal. They're, um, you know, we really want that good communication. So if you have young ones, here's what I say. When I had little kids, a year and a half old and three years old, I said, I want children who I know I am raising right now every day that I know they will be super level headed when they're driving a car when they're 16. Mm -hmm. And that empowered everything that I did with my kids and my son at 12 he was angry at me and he said mom I'm angry with you and I can't speak to you right now about this and then the next day before I went to school I said I really want to talk about that can you he had his backpack on he was backing up toward the door and he said mom you um, frustrated me you disappointed me and I don't ever want that to happen again and here's what I want to see instead and this is what I want to have how I want to have that happen in the future with our communication and whatever and I, I was bawling and I said, you know, some 28 year olds don't know that, you know, some 60 year olds don't know how to say that because he understood how to touch base, what was going on. He didn't separate from that space of knowing who he is and what, how he ticks. Mm -hmm. so, and asking for what you need, which we all have a hard time doing. I mean, I don't know how many years of therapy it took for myself to just be able to check in and say, okay. What do I need and how can I best advocate for myself and ask for that? Because we're just taught to be as women martyrs and to be selfless and not have needs and not, you know, ask for anything. And even that is huge for a young person to be able to recognize and, and do in their life. Absolutely. Yeah, that's beautiful. He just had a scuffle. He's a bit older and he was going to walk away because he needed to cry. And I said, you know what? Come cry right here because I can't let a man go away and not address that, that sadness, or it's going to turn into anger. I can't send, I, like, on my conscience, I can't have another man that's angry <laughs> that I created, you know, like, mm -mm, mm -hmm. not that I created another one that's angry, but we, we need to, that's okay to be emotional. It's okay mm -hmm. to let go. And, and he was frustrated, you know, I mean, so, so it is important. Um, it's not important. It's, 
it's essential. It's our birthright to be emotional. And it starts with things like when kids fall down and scrape their knee, that's an opportunity for natural consequence. What do you need? Or do you think that's okay? Instead of you're all right, that's the bootstraps. That's a pull yourself mm-hmm. up by your bootstraps. That's not working out. It's not worked out. No. And it's telling them what they need without being in their body and knowing. I mean, we don't know what anybody else needs. We can barely figure it out for ourselves. But Jessica, and that, that is the crowning statement is we barely know for ourselves. So how do we know for that child? Because we're older, we think we have more experience, but we don't know what it feels like in their body. They could have mm-hmm. hit the bone. I mean, and I'm not saying be dramatic. It's right. get them to inform. And also as a parent, I realized at some point, it's really important for me to also be true to what I need. So my kids would come home from school and most days I'd be happy and sit and talk to them. But some days I'd be so engrossed in work and I'd be a little bit stressed. And I'd say to them, you know what? Today's not a day to chit chat after, after school. Um, if you need, do you have any like physical, mental, emotional needs? And nope. And then I'd say, then let's talk at five o'clock at dinner and, and we'll connect then. Because, and it shows kids how to do that with mm-hmm. kindness, awareness of myself. I'm clearly stating I'm not in a place to do this. So that means they naturally don't come and solicit, you know, because they already had the chance to do that and they'll take care of it or figure it out or wait. And mm-hmm. these are ways to be a human. And it's a good way to be a human because sometimes you have to deal with things. You know, you have to get your own banana. <laughs> I don't know. And for little yeah. kids, I got so sick of, you know, constantly giving snacks and so on. But one of my friends said, put a bowl on the table of the things you would want them to have, like a little pouch of nuts or um, bananas and apples and, and a little squeezy apple sauces. And mm-hmm. I was like, that's brilliant because then they've got access to this, you know? And yeah. Then, yeah. So um, these are important pieces. It's, it's a lot, being yeah. a, parent, a lot being a parent in our world today too. Mm-hmm. Do you think that technology, I mean, I just look at children and having so much of a more difficult time growing up in today's society with social media, technology, phones, being inundated and stimulated all the time, constantly versus when I grew up, when I came home from school, I didn't have a cell phone. Uh, I could shut the door and it ended. I was home. I was safe. I could, you know, there was a natural break in my time at school to my time at home. I wasn't available to everyone all the time. Is that making highly sensitive children, is it far more difficult for them to be able to shut out all of the stimuli? Well, so I have a few things to say about this is that this is their world and Mm -hmm. this will be their future. So I know that my generation, I'm a generation X, right? is saying, oh my gosh, this is a lot, but we didn't have it as children. I played in the right. woods my entire childhood, right? Yeah. So, well, or I was in the city downtown having fun shopping, or, you know, so because we aren't handling it as well, they might do it better. So there's that opportunity. And I have to say with that, I don't know, but what I did with my family and what I, when I teach about parenting, I, I recommend this is set a family value system. Mm -hmm. Our value system is love, don't bite, because we had pets before we had humans. And then um, no slamming doors, because that is scary for the highly sensitive. You know, it's Mm -hmm. too much noise, too much intensity. And um, the the last one is every day you nourish your body, mind, and spirit. So my son is more about the body, and he'll come downstairs, and we usually have the box greens that are like we normally have arugula with spinach, and like, you know. And he'll stand there and take handfuls and eat the greens because he knows like, I'm going to have a crappy dinner at my, the work, the job he does or, you know, mm-hmm. but that so, so they're doing it. And my daughter, it's hysterical, but she is um, in college from home right now it was her option or her choice that she made. So she, she'll um, stop everything she's doing in a room. She spends a lot of time in a room and she'll come marching down. And every night she goes on a walk for like an hour. And from, we live in a cold place from March. Um, we're right. Yeah. From March until November, she walks barefoot and oh she'll up into the woods and she'll go, you know, cause we live in a wooded area or she'll, she'll head onto the sidewalk and go into the town where we live, you know, but um, well, we don't live in a small town, but needless to say, so, so she knows, and she has that sense. And I'm more concerned about them being able to tune into that and know when they need things mm-hmm. than worry about you did too much media. Now I did not allow my kids full access to media until the youngest one was 11. Mm -hmm. And that probably, I I wish I could have gone further, but I think, um, I just, it's just the point in which we were like, I can't, 
I can't manage this anymore. It felt too controlling. And I feel like my kids have done a really good job with it. My son said, and I can't remember, maybe sixth grade, I'm going to try and be more social and, and get out there more. And by ninth grade, he amped that up. And, um, and now he has a really full and robust social life with a, a three handfuls of, of groups of people and a beautiful girlfriend I and mean, just a lovely woman or girl woman. Um, so, so there's the deal is you give them the freedom to have choice, but if we do this thing where we're like, okay, just do have your media. And then we lash back at them. You're on media too much. That's in this parenting model that actually is very damaging to highly sensitive children. And it's the enabling and the controlling, which really at its hilt comes out of narcissism and codependency. <laughs> mm-hmm. And the powerful way is to be thoughtful about it. Um, you know what? We're going to let go to that. You know what? I'm going to deal with myself when you don't turn in the worksheet. It's, it's more of a finesse. Um, so if kids are using it to control and sedate themselves, that's addiction. There's no mm-hmm. other way around it. And that's up to you as a parent to have said the message about reinforcing the boundaries of we, like for me, we nourish our body, mind, and spirit. How does that look for you, daughter? How does that look for you, son? And, um, and then they manage it and monitor it. And I see my kids doing it. So on their own without being asked, but mm-hmm. what I did reinforce it is when they were younger, you know, how are you going to nourish your body today? Hmm. You know, <laughs> so yeah, I hope that yeah. I, mean, I have a little bit of a different take, I think. Yeah, no, I think it's so beautiful. And you've offered up so many resources and I will have links to all of those in the show notes, the books you mentioned. Um, but are, are you doing work out in the community with highly sensitive children? You know, um, Jessica, I am. I'm, I'm just, I've thought about it a long time and I have worked with parents through doing these counseling sessions. So that is on my website. Okay. But at the bottom of my homepage on my website, I have a colleague and she has a business called Empath Mama. And in her business is where I'm teaching the classes around parenting. Um, And and she also has a highly sensitive child and and they had quite a struggle. So we're championing that together, but I'm really doing the teaching around the parenting and she's really helping the parent um, who is empathic, who is this high, you know, sensitive person. Mm -hmm. And so that's where you can find, but right now, I think on the 13th of, let me think the 17th of May, I believe we're hosting a free class and she has a few of those coming and then she's moving that into a membership. So if that's reasonable, it's 24 bucks a month. (laughs) Yeah. But that's where you can find the work. I can't do it all under the umbrella of my business. For sure. Awesome. Well, we will definitely put links to all of that and I will get this podcast out before then. So people maybe can sign up for that free class. This has been so enlightening and really just understanding I think it comes down to understanding, you know, we're all different and we don't know what's best for another person. And you know, especially as parents, I think we need to recognize that our children are different from one another. They're different from, from us. Our experiences are different from when we grew up to how they are. And that, you know, giving a platform to really see our children for who they are and accept them for who they are, if they're highly sensitive or not, or whatever they're working with and just being able to let them flourish and grow. Absolutely. And we need it. We need it more than ever. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we need we need some change makers out there for sure. Awesome. Amy, thank you so much for your time. Is there anything that we skipped that we needed to get to? I think we No, I think we knocked it out. On your end. So thank you, Jessica, for having me. And great. You have so many wonderful stories and just insight. And I'm excited to see how this continues to grow and spread the word. And um I will send you the link to the podcast when it gets out so you can share that as well. Okay. Thanks so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Have a good, a beautiful day. Yeah, thanks. You too. Bye.